Hi, I'm Bess Godin, and welcome to Millennial Splaining. So, I bet you're wondering, who is this bitch? Who died and made her the ultimate authority to speak for her entire generation? Well, the answer is, I'm nobody. I have no authority whatsoever. Like so many millennials, I was told to get an education. Then, I graduated into a barren and opportunityless economy. We are the most overeducated and underemployed. The greatest minds of my generation go unheard. They are too busy serving coffee, flipping burgers, moving boxes, babysitting, and pumping gas to survive. All the while applying to better jobs that they are also overqualified for, but for which they know they'll never get an interview. And finally, at the end of a long day, we have time not to relax, but to work on our blogs and YouTube channels so we can have some modicum of expression in a world where we are told daily that we are disposable. And with each of these desperate efforts to grab hold of the national microphone, we find ourselves slipping further and further away from it because the world doesn't want to hear our problems. By corporate reinforced choice, we are a generation lost in obscurity. Hi, Sabby. Thank you so much for joining me on Millennial Explaining. Hi, Bess. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, I'm so excited that, uh, you know, I got to speak to you a couple of times and I was like, you know what, this is not enough savvy. I need to have a one-on-one. So, uh, you were the host of the Savvy Sab show, um, and you have your own network, but you're also a uh, part of Fred Hampton left. Right. Yep. Um, yeah. So uh, tell me, um, just give me a little quick intro to yourself if you'd like, and, uh, and then we'll jump into some news. Awesome. Um, I'm Sabrina Salvati. I'm the host of the Savvy Sab show. And I'm also with the Fred Hampton Leftist Network. Um, I actually got into podcasting rather recently. It was after Force the Vote. I was already uh, vlogging on YouTube. So I already had uh, a platform And the reason why I decided to do this is because I just felt like we didn't have enough voices in leftist commentary space. We didn't have enough women. We didn't have enough African-Americans. And people weren't really getting a chance to hear like our perspective as much. So I wanted to to change that. Um, It has really kind of taken off. I I did not expect it. (laughs) I did not expect that to happen (laughs) as, as soon as it did. Um, but we've had a lot of support from people like, um, viewers and, um, I've had so many people like reach out to me and say, thank you for what you're doing. So there's, there's been a lot of tremendous, uh, support and it's interesting because my background is in higher education. So I work in higher ed in the beginning, I didn't really see how I could use my background in this space. But then once I started doing it and started talking about politics a lot, I realized that the political space is very similar to the structure that we have in the higher education system. Um, They kind of operate the same. And it's part of the reason why we have the problems that we have in politics and in higher ed. They're actually similar. So I'm able to connect the two. Awesome. Yeah. Let's dive into that a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, what, so what are the similarities that you see? I mean, I can only imagine, I mean, you know, I, I, I have my experience too in higher ed. Um, but you know, it's like essentially like, like, a, like the playground, right. That CEOs and lawyers play on. Right. So it's, it's yeah. how they learn how to become who they are. So yeah. Tell me a little bit about your experience with that. Yeah, so it's interesting because higher ed, when people think of universities, they see a school. But those of us who work at those universities, we know that they're very corporate, especially the ones that are these elite private institutions, right? Like Harvard or uh, Boston College. Like these are elite institutions. They make a lot of money. And sometimes the money is not always well spent or put in the areas that are under resourced. Where this connects with politics is the structure. So in politics, it's interesting because you have candidates, they campaign. Um, Most of the time their donors are corporate donors, but you have grassroots candidates who try to campaign through money from the people and not take money from corporations. But what we have seen this past year, uh, especially with the squad, is that even those grassroots candidates are still going along with 
establishment Democrats, the corporate Democrats. So in the political space, you have a, a president of the United States and you have Congress and you have the Senate, but the president doesn't really call all the shots like you think that they would. All of these politicians are beholding to their, their donors. So if they have corporate donors, that is who they are going to serve. They're supposed to serve the people, but they don't. They're public servants. They're supposed to serve us, but they don't. They serve the corporations. In higher ed, at universities, you have a president and you have a provost. And then you have all the people underneath. You have faculty, you have administrators, and then you have students. A lot of times people will assume that the president of the university makes all the decisions. That's actually not true. The president and the provost at these universities have a board of trustees, similar to the corporate donors that politicians have. So the board of trustees actually are the ones that make the decisions because that's where the money comes from. They're the ones that fund these elite institutions. And if there are things going on that they don't like at these universities, then they can easily just say, all right, that's it, I'm out. That, that's how it works. There are people at universities that have positions where they travel across the country to try to recruit more donors, people to donate money to the university. Most of the time it's alumni, people who attended there in the past and have become really successful. These will be CEOs, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, people that have a lot of money. And oftentimes what I've seen, if they are not satisfied with the direction that the school is going, if they're not satisfied with the enrollment numbers, they will decide not to renew their donation. And that has actually happened recently with the school that I work with. So why is that problematic? It's problematic because when you look at someone like Cornell West, we saw the situation that happened with him and Harvard and them not wanting to give him tenure. And that wasn't the first time he worked at Harvard. He's worked at Harvard before uh, because of his support for Palestine. That's not even Harvard University making that decision. That's their donors. A lot of their donors are CEOs. You have people like Robert Kraft, Mike Bloomberg, who has an entire academic program named after him at Harvard. So these are the people who are making the decisions. And as long as you have corporations making those decisions in higher ed and in, in the political space, the people will never truly get the things that we're fighting for. Yeah, 3 million percent. And that's an excellent point. The people who are telling these universities what to do are the same people telling our government what to do are the same people that run, that are running our corporations. So yeah, I mean, three, 3 million percent. I mean, is it a training ground? Kind of. Is it, is it more of, you know, like a, a think tank where they, they sort of manufacture people to spit in the system? Y yeah, more, more so. <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah. You have to look at how many politicians went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. You have to look at that. Like, this is really important. So like when someone like Mike Bloomberg ran for president, it was hilarious to me that so many people who said that they were, you know, quote unquote liberal or whatever, um, were like, yeah, we should vote for Mike Bloomberg. And I'm like, stop and frisk Mike Bloomberg, that yeah. same guy. So a university like Harvard was never going to back a Bernie Sanders. They're not going to do that. They would back a Mike Bloomberg because he's one of their donors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike Bloomberg, <laughs> he only won like, <laughs> he only won like one uh, region or whatever, right? Like, <laughs> and it was like, it was definitely somewhere he he donated to. It was like out in the boons in like Hawaii or something. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How anyone could have possibly taken him seriously except for himself. Um, yeah, he was, he was a, a waste of money and I'm, I'm, as I'm sure is his career. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about, um, you know, let's, let's, let's rag on AOC and the squad and, 
try to push them to do something (laughs) (laughs) because seriously like you know we definitely had the idea that if we got into you know if we had more progressives in the democratic party like you know we could really change government from within and and like you know that you felt right until you know these people got into office and all of a sudden they're like oh wait a second they're in power though and they're not doing anything and they i'm but they you know they are in power though because like like literally they have uh you know the pull to say no to everything that nancy pelosi wants to do everything and they don't do it they don't do it um and so like you know i personally still support um other uh candidates that are running for office especially locally um and stuff and i my philosophy is sort of this i believe that we should support candidates that we believe in until they get into office and they start to disappoint us and then we need to stop funding them and then we need to demand that they do what we want or you know they're gone essentially right so i see it this way like you know we at this point, and I don't know for sure, but at this point, I'm assuming that AOC and Cori Bush, people like that, they're getting like maybe 60% of their funding from um, uh, grassroots donations at this point. There are people who are admirers and whatever, um, and maybe 40% from the donors, right? Like like originally maybe it was 80-20 and now it's 60-40 or something like that. So there's definitely been a change, you can see it. So I think at this point, once we have, you know, once we still have any leverage whatsoever over these people, you know, we need to stop funding them now and start demanding. And the thing is, you can't just stop, you can't just stop funding, right? You have to, you have to couple that with a demand. Otherwise people don't know what's going on they'll just run right into their corporate donors or whatever but if we make it very fucking clear that like you take any money any money at all Mm -hmm. from these people and we see it we see it we see you nancy pelosi funneling you know dark money into these people we see you know we we see it so let's not get cute you know let's not try to to cover it up with cute tweets and stuff um you know America is not stupid. So, you know, we need to say, let's, I'm, I'm not going to donate to you guys. And hell, I wasn't doing it before. I can't afford it, but (laughs) I'm not (laughs) donating to you guys seriously in the future because you aren't doing what we like elected you to do. You aren't fighting for us. So you need to start fighting for us and you need to start, you need to stop taking corporate money and you need to stop listening to their directives. Otherwise you're gone. What use are you to me? So, yeah, I mean, I, I really believe that these people, we, we sort of trained to look, we're trained to look at them like they're supposed to be our movement leaders, right? But when has a politician ever been a movement leader? You know, like that's not, that's not how this works. Like we need to step up to the plate and use our politicians as chess pieces. Like we like to talk a lot about 3D chess during, you know, the 2020 election and all that stuff. But the reality is, is that we're the chess players, right? We're the chess players against the corporations. And that's what we need to think about our politicians as the pieces. Yeah, go for it. Absolutely. I mean, look, Justice Democrats has dark money now. So if you're running as a justice Democrat, that doesn't say much to me anymore. It doesn't have the same weight that it used to have because now Justice Dems is just falling in line with all the other corporate donors. So no, that that's that's not a good thing right now. So for me, I mean, I donated money to people running the squad. I donated a, a lot to Bernie Sanders. I donated money to Bernie Sanders when I really didn't have the money to do so. When really I should, I, I should have held on to that money, to be honest with you. I donated what I could, and it was very little at that time. I donated what I could to to Nina Turner. Then and then I had to stop. I just it just what good does it do me? What good does it do the people to continue to donate money to them? And they're not going to fight for these issues. They're going to get into Congress and they're going to vote along with corporate Democrats. I'm kind of sick of hearing that, well, they don't really have any power because there have been multiple times throughout these past couple of months where they could have used their power. The Capitol Police funding bill, when you vote present on that bill, you were not using your power. And you saw Ayanna Presley and Cori Bush were the only ones that voted against it. And Jamal Bowman, um, Rashida Tlaib, and AOC voted present. 
that didn't make any sense to me. That was a time when they could have used their leverage to actually implement change, to make a statement, to let the corporate Democrats in Congress know that you are for real and you are going to fight for the people. They didn't do it. We asked them to force the vote, which would have been an opportune time to get Nancy Pelosi out. They, they couldn't even do that. They couldn't go to the town hall. All of them were invited. Not one person, you couldn't send in one, not one person showed up. So, and that was an event that was trending on YouTube. It, it, so to me, it just doesn't make any sense. So again, if they're going to get into office and just do the same thing as corporate Democrats, then what are they there for? Why are you running a grassroots campaign? Why are you asking us to donate to you if you're going to be like the other politicians? That is problematic to me. So I personally will not be giving money to them. Um, when it comes to local elections, I tell people that if you are going to run for office and you really want to implement change, that's probably your best shot. Because I've known people that have run for city council. I've known people that have run for mayor. Those positions have a little bit more leeway to make some of these changes. I moved to Boston when Mayor Marty Walsh was still here. He was still in office. He had been in office for a long time. And he decided to step down. Marty Walsh ran. Uh, he won. And he implemented changes in Boston. And not even like a couple years later, like he started implementing changes like right away. So you have a little bit more leverage. You have a little bit more pull. Now he didn't do everything perfectly, of course, but he was able to do those things. Same thing for city council. People look down on these positions. They think that because it's not a position in DC, that it's not important. That's actually not true. City council controls the budget. What more, <laughs> what more chance to implement change than to control the budget, to be a part of that. So I think people need to focus more on making changes in your local community while we can, because the national changes, electing justice Democrats is just not coming about. They are not the majority. As long as they are not the majority in Congress or the Senate, you're always going to have the corporate Democrats are going to go against them. And now they, they've joined in, in with them. So what's the point? Yeah. What's the point? What does it get me? I mean, you want to talk, you want to talk business, you know, like what's the cost benefit analysis of me investing in your candidacy, right? <clears throat> Nada. I mean, especially when you look at, you know, the, the current eviction, I guess, circus that they had <laughs> on the Capitol steps, um, you know, that did literally nothing, literally nothing, because now the Congress is not back in session, right? Or, and yep. they, you know, the Supreme Court has ruled that, uh, you know, their, their stay of their decision mm -hmm. is over now. All those people can get evicted and nobody's doing anything about it now. So this was, you know, a, what, not even, not even a, a month extension, <laughs> a two week extent, extension. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's not. So, so here's the thing. The ask was too small. Way it was too small. Yes. They should have asked them to cancel the rent because if you were already a couple months behind on your rent, continuing to extend it, that doesn't really give you an advantage there. That doesn't catch you up. You still have to pay the back rent and you have to pay your current rent. That doesn't help you. Where are they supposed to get all that money from? If they didn't yeah. have money for rent two months ago, why do you think they would have the money for it now? Mm -hmm. well, they have to take into consideration, like, look, the American people did not cause COVID. This is not our fault. It's not our fault that cities shut down, that states shut down, and people couldn't work, especially people that work in the service industry. I waited tables when I was in college. And mm -hmm. a little bit after I graduated from college, because I didn't find a job right away. Mm -hmm. And all those people that wait tables, all the people that like were bartending and depend on those tips and depend on that money to pay their rent. Imagine living in a city like I did Boston that shut down and you have, you have nothing. So what are you going to do? You're going to apply for rental assistance. Well, I have news for you. The state of Massachusetts rejected 90% of the rental assistant applications. They were rejected. So, oh, God. Like, what's even the point of, of 
having a rental assistance department, right? Right. <laughs> and, and also another thing I want to add too, is that some of these states and some of these cities didn't even get the rental assistance funds out to people. Some people were still waiting on those funds. So this is not the fault of the American people. This is a capitalism issue. This is what happens when we have been exploited for so long. We have, we depend on this and we never had a system set up in this country that should something like the pandemic happen, we would be protected. We would be covered financially. So for the people who are saying that, well, people should have had money saved up for a rainy day. Well, hell, so should have Amazon. Yeah. But we can bail them out. Yeah. So I don't think people really understand you already had a generation like my generation. A lot of us have a lot of student loan debt, can't afford to just do basic things in life that my parents were able to do without even having a college degree. You can't even do those things now. People can't buy homes. People can't buy. I had to get help from my parents. Like we had to get help from our parents to get a house. And we have a small house. We had to get help from our parents. My parents didn't have to do that and they didn't go to college. So capitalism in this country has failed. The majority of people in this country, we are not, we're just, we are one paycheck away from being homeless. It should have never gotten to this in the wealthiest country in the world. And meanwhile, you have people like Jeff Bezos who are, have billions and billions of dollars and they're paying workers like $15 an hour, telling them they only get like a 15 minute bathroom break. People are peeing in bottles. Like it's absolutely ridiculous. That is one of the downfalls of capitalism. Those people are being exploited. And I think it's one of those things you have to see it or you have to go through it to truly understand when people say, well, then they shouldn't work for those companies. Guys, if you travel through rural America, which I've gone through like rural South, I lived in South Carolina in some of these towns, Amazon is the only employer around because they have shut everybody else out. This is why you've seen so many retail stores, grocery stores close. This was before COVID started closing because Amazon has bought so many people out. So this is a huge problem that we have in this country. And I think the pandemic just, it took the cover off of these economic issues, but the economic issues were always here. COVID just revealed it. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And nobody feels that like millennials because we, we had the worst time coming of age in the 2008 recession. And you can see it <clears throat> financially speaking, because we only own 5% of the wealth in this country, whereas boomers own 55%. Yep. So it makes sense that we have to depend on our parents because they're hoarding all the freaking wealth. Yep. You know, and like you, what you said, exactly. Like, you know, where, where are you going to go? Are, if you work a, a $15 an hour job at Amazon, and you're mad that you have to step over a dead employee to keep working because your supervisor told you to sue, then where are you going to go? Are you going to go to Target? Are you going to go to Walmart? Are you going to go to places where they do the same exact thing but pay you less? No. I mean, I, there's nowhere to go. There are no jobs. I remember seeing a meme back, at, I mean, this was like probably back in like 2013 even where I just it was just a like a rage falcon where it's just like ah and it just said there are no jobs <laughs> <laughs> because that's what I remember screaming at all of the older people in my life all of the older people in my life had jobs forever they were had job security you know like they didn't need to worry about it some of them were retired even and had like pensions and social security and all the stuff we won't have um, you know, and they were all telling me, well, you just got to go pound the pavement. You just got to go keep looking for a job. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I find a job where I work, all the jobs are the same and they all fucking suck. Yeah. I will yeah. never have health insurance. I will never have, you know, and I, ha I had the health insurance for patches and stuff like that, but like for the most part, no, you're not going to get health insurance. You're not going to, you're not going to be able to find a desk job even anymore. I mean, like it took me, like I, I had a bachelor's degree and I granted it was in theater. So, you know, that was a bad idea, but I literally took me about 10 years. No, longer than that. 
I think I got my first desk job in 2015 and I was a secretary. And the rest of that time I was working retail because that's the only places that were hiring, only yeah. places that were hiring. And, um, you know, that's just not a reality that older people have seen. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So I didn't mean to get off on the thing there, but like, you know, 300%, <laughs> absolutely everything you said. Okay. I'm just checking the time. Um, so yeah. And I also let's, so let's also talk about, um, I watched your last episode and you were talking a little bit about, uh, student debt. You got off on this one thing that was so awesome. And, um, I, I took notes on it and now it's on my phone that I'm recording on. So like, that's, that's cool. So now I have to like dig. <laughs> <But, laughs> um, you know, you know, student, student debt is like one of the, you know, I guess, uh, buzzwords of our generation, right? Like that's supposed to be why, and the main reason why that we have no wealth, that we can't get our feet on the ground and stuff like that. I mean, I think it's a huge you know, burden, of course. And I think a lot of us went to colleges and got student loan debt way over any other previous generation, for sure. Uh, but at the same time, I also think it's because of the lack of jobs. And I think it's because of lack of opportunity and the lack of affordability of literally, literally everything. But um, yeah, so I have student loans, right? I have never paid them. I don't know. Again, like I've said this a few times on my show, I probably shouldn't admit that in public, but <laughs> I just literally haven't had the money. I literally have not had the money to pay them. Right. Like that's just, it's never, I've never had extra money to do it. So what I feel like there are so many people in that situation it's better for me when I get a few extra dollars, it's better for me to invest it in, you know, my future than it is to go paying off debts. And I really think that that's something that we should start talking about more on the left and we should encourage people to do. Like, I don't really know the history of debt striking, but I really think we should start doing that because there are way too many people that are drowning in debt and there's no need to pay these people back because your debt has already gone from company to company to company, been sold between other people. And you literally will never be paying back the person that paid your original loan in the first place. So they've already made their money off you. There's no need for us to, to go crazy trying to pay off these debts. Instead, we need to be, you know, we need to be thinking about doing things for our future. Um, you know, and I, I would like to, uh, I would like to personally build small business for myself. I think that other millennials should think about doing that as well. Um, I think that if we start, uh, you know, embodying the changes that we want to see. I am a socialist, so I believe in co-ops. I believe that, you know, we are the best poised to create co-ops because we are the most educated and most, uh, you know, skilled. We have so many skill sets that are underutilized. Um, and so we're in the, we're best poised to do that. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I promote ourselves building a power base that's sort of separate from, uh, you know, the, the, the establishment. What do you think about that? And how, you know, how would you, you know, how would you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, I agree. Like I personally, look, I've been working since I was 16 years old. One of the things I've learned is I don't really like working for other people. I just don't. And I think what maybe the older generation should come to understand is that a lot of us, we are working for employers that they don't really want it. They tell you, you you can get like time off, but they don't, but then it's kind of frowned upon when you do it. Uh, they only want you to take time off at certain, certain times of the year. Um, they, they say you can, you get the sick time, but then it's like you use too much of it. Then they have issues with it. It's, there's all these stipulations that come along with it. And our generation has been made to feel very guilty, very guilty for wanting work-life balance. And that is very important for your mental health. That is important for your physical health. And so a lot of people in my generation, they're going through things like anxiety and depression. And a lot of that has to do with the stress, the overwhelming stress that we have in the workplace, working for a lot of these supervisors that it's, it's, they want you to work till late at night. They want you to like, do, it, the work comes first, the job comes first, not thinking about the fact that some of us have families. 
Some of us have, you know, other responsibilities outside of work. I have coworkers that have to get to the daycare at a certain time. If they don't, then they have to pay a lay fee for being late. And I've, I've had coworkers who were late every day and have to just fork over $50 every time that they're late because their boss wants them to stay later and work on this. We are overworked. We are underpaid. And I, I told you before I came on about the people in IT that quit. And that's another profession that people don't understand. Like a lot of people working in IT, they are, they are underpaid for all the things that they do and, and underappreciated. So you have people in this generation that have graduated from college. We have a lot of student loan debt. We weren't given salaries that would actually uh, give us an affordable, an, a, a, a living life, just being able to live in general. I'm seeing people graduate from some of these elite colleges with like hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loan debt and their first job, the only job that they can get only wants to pay them $50,000 a year. Now, realistically, how are you going to pay off all that student loan debt with that type of salary? And on top of that, these companies aren't promoting people. They're not, we don't get any kind of pension. Like these are things that the boomer generation, they got these things. I remember back in the day when people got company cars, I don't even think that's a thing anymore. So it's like, they want you to do, invest all of a lot of our time into the workplace. There is no work-life balance. They kill me with that. All these companies, you, you, you look up like their benefits, they'll have a section on work-life balance, but then you start working there and you realize, no, people are coming in at eight o'clock in the morning, sometimes seven o'clock in the morning. They may leave at five, but when they get home, they're still doing work. They're still answering emails. And this is why I tell people, take your email off your phone. Do not, I was guilty of that. Take your email off your phone. They're still answering emails. I get emails from people midnight, one o'clock in the morning. What is happening here? There is no work-life balance. This is not healthy. This is terrible for your mental health. And this is why a lot of us are in the state that we're in. People say, well, millennials are pessimistic. They just, they're just not hopeful. They're not trying hard enough. Uh, if you live the life that we lived, you would understand why we're not pessimistic. We're living in a country that doesn't want to give people a living wage, that doesn't want to give everybody health care. We're living in a country that doesn't want to even really try to fix the effects of climate change. So I'm living in a city that who knows in the next 10, 20 years, you know, the, the, the sea level, it's rising. It's rising. So then you have to deal with that. You have to combat that Uh it is, it's a lot to take in. It is a lot to go through. And I'm seriously concerned for the mental health of millennials, of Gen Z, every generation coming behind us. Because if you are coming from a family that does not have money, that is not already wealthy, it is going to be incredibly difficult for you because the capitalist situation in this country is not improving. It is, it's decreasing. It's declining in this country. So I have students that are from China and they'll tell me that like, hey, I get a degree in the US, I'm pretty much guaranteed a job back home. We can't even guarantee American people jobs here. We can't guarantee our own people jobs in this country. So when people go on to like CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and they brag about the fact that, oh, look at the jobs report, look at all of these jobs that have been created. You notice you never hear them talk about the salaries. It doesn't matter if you created 100,000 jobs. If the salaries are shit, these people are still going to struggle. And that is something that needs to be acknowledged. Inflation continues to increase, salaries decrease, and not to mention some of these employers are now asking for more years of experience for the same jobs that five years ago did not require that many years of experience. How can you tell an undergraduate student just graduating from college that they need to have five years of experience for a job that's going to pay $15 an hour? Give me a break. Are you kidding me? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Actually, you just described my situation perfectly. <laughs> I went to get a master's degree to be, um, a children's librarian in a school and uh the year that i went forbes magazine declared that my master's degree was the least profitable master's degree one could possibly get so that was exciting um and he turned out 
<laughs> that editor turned out to be correct because um, I, you know, essentially what I do now, uh, that was, that was like maybe, that was at least five to 10 years ago. Um, and what I do now is I take care of a special needs girl. I was specifically hired because I had master's uh, education and um, I get paid $20 an hour. That's 33, six a year. Okay. And I live by myself. I don't have a family. I don't have parents anymore. Uh, I have my girlfriend and their family. I have, um, you know, I have a couple of friends that are very good to me and that's it. And, you know, and I'm like not even living paycheck to paycheck. Like I'm constantly behind, you know, I mean, that's just, that's the reality of my situation. And I have all this in education, you know, and they, they train you, like you're going to go into like the, the tippity top echelon of corporate society and fucking like $50,000 a year is a dream to me, man. Like that's, that's my, like, I literally told my doctor once who was asking about my life situation. I was like, you know, I, I have an interview for my dream job. And they were, and my doctor was like, oh, is it something you always wanted to do? And I was like, oh no, the, the actual job is something I could never care less about, but it pays $50,000. <laughs> I've yep. never made that much in my life. Never made yep. that much. I'm making the most that I've ever made right now. And that is again, under 35 a year. <laughs> and it, it, it also depends on where you live too, because $50,000 in Massachusetts is nothing. Yeah. It's like, you still have to have roommates. Like it just, so they know, I, I don't understand why we don't have a cost of living wage. And then you have states that have, you know, they've done away with, there used to be a cost of living uh, raise here. We used mm -hmm. to have a cost of living raise. This was like, like years ago, they got rid of that. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's just like, you're constantly asking people to work harder, work longer hours. And then you want to do this thing where everybody gets a flat 2% raise across the board, but your health insurance increases. So that 2% rate, that raise that you get along with inflation, it really doesn't do much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing. And oh yeah, by the way, I don't get health insurance. I don't get uh, paid time off. Uh, I don't get sick days. That yeah. was my last. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, I know like when I, when I waited tables, similar thing, there was no health insurance. There was no paid time off. Like if you took vacation, that meant you, that meant I wasn't making money those days because I, I wasn't like waiting tables. Um, if you got sick, you didn't make money that night. So it, it's yeah. absolutely ridiculous. And this is why health insurance shouldn't be tied to your job. Just give health insurance to everybody. So they don't have to worry about this. I know people holding on to their jobs just because they need the health insurance, because mm -hmm. if they quit their job, then they don't have health insurance and they have medical conditions where they need to have it. It is a uh, slave mentality. Yes. And you are a slave to your job. You are a slave to your employer. And that is what we have going on in this country. It is very sad. I know many people that would like to quit their jobs and start their own business, but they, they don't again, because they need the health insurance. It's a sick system. And so mm -hmm. many other countries in this world give health insurance to everybody in their country. And we're the wealthiest country and we can't do it because the politicians that we have in office, they get donations from big pharma, from Blue Cross Blue Shield, it's, it's another one, which is really bad with, with politician donations. And so the money, that's money for their pockets. That's money for their campaign, for their next election. And so if you continue to support these politicians, if you continue to fund them and you continue to vote for them, they're never going to change what they do. So if you really want to have a movement in this country, you're right. These movements are not led by politicians. Civil rights movement was not led by a politician. Neither was the women's rights movement. You have to get the people to rise up and protest and you have to continuously do it. It took MLK a long time. It took several protests to get equality or equality for black people in this country. And that's why I want people to understand it takes a, it's going to take a March on Washington, like what MLK had, like you have to have thousands and thousands of people. And so what really pissed me off about AOC and Corey Bush's uh, performance stunt at the Capitol is that if they really wanted this to be a movement, they could have announced that they were doing this protest on Twitter. 
They could have gone on to people's shows, independent media shows that they ignore now and talked about this protest and thousands of people could have come out, but they didn't because they didn't want to draw as much attention to it as they claim. They got just enough attention to show that they were trying to do something and they really didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I talked to Afeni about it. Um, you can see that on my channel and, uh, you know, like they, that was an actual decision that they made was, was to, they decided not to reach out to people and ask them to come. And I, it was partially because of the Capitol police and they were concerned that the Capitol police would start to get aggressive with them. And that's something that they voted for to fund. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And Hey, that happens in protests. If you're really going to fight that's something that you have to deal with. We That's saw right. that with the Black Lives Matter movement. We saw that with the George Floyd protest. We saw the police, obviously, yes, they are going to be there. So what? That's right. We saw police like beat up MLK and put him in jail. Mm -hmm. Do you think that stopped him from fighting, from protesting? No. So this idea that you're going to have this protest, but you don't want many people and you don't want to draw in police. You don't want the police attention. That's not a protest. That's a classroom. You were mm -hmm. just there sitting down, having class. They could have had way more people there. It is absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely. Well said. I know we're coming up on your time here. So, um, you know, let's, uh, let's, let's have final thoughts and where we can reach you and all that good stuff. Absolutely. Uh, final thoughts for me is I would say that we have to start demanding more in this country. We cannot just continue to sit back and allow our government to treat us the way that they are treating us. And that's going to mean that it's going to take thousands of people to come out and protest. If you can't physically protest, that's okay. You can do uh, promotion. You can advertise these protests. You can have virtual town halls with people to get the word out and get the message out. There's a general strike that is happening in October. I just got an update about that the other day that I'll be talking about as well because it has a different name now. You have to get the word out about these things and get more and more people involved. And in order to do that, that also means that you're going to have to talk to people that are not necessarily leftists. You may have to talk to people that are conservatives because some of them still want to fight for the same things that we want. Look at the, the union strike that's going on in Alabama. They're asking for the same things. So if we can just get aside, get away from the two-party system and focus on the issues that will help people in this country, I think we can create a large movement. So that's my thoughts on that, but it's going to take the people, Is politicians are not going to do it for us. Forget about the squad. They're paid now, they're in. They only need five years to get their pension. It is what it is. They have become career politicians now. They're not really trying to fight for us anymore. Just giving you the reality of the situation. Absolutely. Where you can find me, um, you can find me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Sabby Sabs 2. You can find me on YouTube. My channel is Sabby Sabs. And you can also find me on Rockfin as well under the same name. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been such a great conversation and I really hope we get to do it again soon because I feel like there's so much more we, we could cover. I agree. Thanks so much for having me on best. This was fun. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You may have noticed that I don't do live streams. It's a lot and I'm like one person. Okay. But I would still love to be able to uplift your voices the way that live streamers do by highlighting your chats or your indie businesses because I know how hard it is for a millennial out here, and I'm happy to share my platform with people who support me. If you would like to see your comment or small business promo, scrolling at the bottom of my screen, then go to co-b.com slash and buy me a coffee for $3. If you would like to ask me a question and actually get a response, then buy me two coffees at $6 and I will put your question in my next Q&A episode. If you would like to insult me, I can take it. I got a thick skin. And honestly, I have a good sense of humor as well. Like my upcoming Q&A episodes, I will be doing special insult episodes. So if you would like to see your insult on my insult highlight reel episode, and possibly get one back, then please buy me two coffees for $6. Then I'll be more than happy to clap back. Listen, I've been through hard times myself. And if you're really, really struggling and trying to start a business, if you need mutual aid help, you can always message me on Twitter um, or at melensplain at gmail.com. And I will try to help you. That goes for anybody who needs to escape a bad situation to anybody trying to start a small business. 
it's important to me that I lift up all of our voices and not just mine. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, this is my second side hustle. I love being able to speak out on these issues, but the reality of the situation is in this capitalist hell that we live in. If I don't make any money from doing this, then I have to stop doing it altogether. Right now, living paycheck to paycheck for me doesn't actually even cut it. That's why I need your help. I don't have a Patreon. I can't offer you more content than what I put out publicly. I don't have the time, I don't have the money, and I don't have the energy. If you want to see more content and you want special member features, you have a PayPal account that you can donate to, then support me and together we can make it happen. If not, I will fade away into the ether. <laughs> As always, for all my links, please go to melensplain.com. Thank you.